hello guys welcome hi i'm here with the amazing dr judy morgan <laughs> say hi <laughs> so judy i found out about you from uh a, a group on facebook actually you're very popular in the dog community how how long did it take to to build this huge following that you have and i know you're you're a vet already but has this been a lifelong uh thing that you've been doing no. So I started out as a, uh, I've been practicing medicine for 35 years. So I, I'm revealing some age there. Uh, but I started out as a very traditional veterinarian and eh, maybe about 10 years into my career, I kind of got on the alternative and holistic track. And 10 years after that, uh, I, I got challenged to write a book kind of is how it sort of started. And so after I wrote that book, I, I needed to figure out how to let people know that that book existed and how to market it. And that's how my Facebook state, uh, page started. I knew nothing about social media. So uh, it's actually been a little bit slow going. It's, uh, you know, once it, it hits a tipping point, then it starts to tumble. Um, and so we're at about 50,000 uh, social media followers at this point. And I mean, for me, it's all about educating the public. And that's what I use my social media platform for. And I just want more people to understand how to keep their animals healthy. That's yeah, I love your I've been watching your YouTube videos um, that yeah. you do. <laughs> Did you shoot ones today? I, I was so busy setting up. I didn't get to check it out yet. We did not this morning. Uh, we had one of those crazy mornings. My mother's 15 and a half year old, 50 pound uh, standard schnauzer decided to have a stroke at about three o'clock this morning. So we live with my parents and my mom came to the bottom of the stairs and called up and said, Judy, something's wrong with Shotzi. So you know, of course my husband and I come flying down the stairs. Now this was after I had just given one of our dogs a shower because one of them had diarrhea all over herself. So it was one of those kind of like crazy nights. At three in the morning? Um, yeah, so I gave the one dog a shower at midnight and then at three, you know, come flying down the stairs and my mom's dog literally was kind of in the throes of a seizure weird episode and couldn't really figure out what was going on, but I thought, well, okay, we got to go to the clinic. So, you know, took the dog to the clinic and about halfway to the clinic, the dog stood up in the back of the car and looked around and said, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> and she's been pretty good since. So she's 15 and a half and I think she just had a little stroke episode and we'll just watch her pretty closely. Uh -huh. um, but she's been pretty good today. So anyway, and then I had to do a rabies clinic today. So it was just one of the, we did not get on air. <laughs> that was the long answer. <laughs> how do you, how can you tell if a dog is having a stroke? Well, so there's usually some pretty telltale signs and she had about half of them. So they, they start to roll. It actually acts sort of like an inner ear problem and their vestibular apparatus is off. So they'll get a head tilt and she did have that. So her head was tilted really far to one side and she couldn't right herself. She was on her side and she kept trying to push herself up and she kept falling to the side that her head was tilted toward. So that made sense for a stroke, but they also normally have rapid eye movement back and forth or around in circles. And she didn't have that. Her eyes were very focused, uh, but she couldn't stand on her own. She could, and she was very rigid. So if it was a seizure, it was a weird seizure. If it was a stroke, it was a weird stroke, but it had been going on for about a half an hour. And so that's why it was also a little weird, but she popped out of it on her own. Normally with a stroke, they'll pop out of it, but it usually takes a couple of days. And uh -huh. so she, came up very quickly. So we'll watch her. We'll see, see what happens. But, you know, it's kind of one of those things. My mom is four foot 10 and weighs a hundred pounds soaking wet. And so she's standing there with her 50 pound dog going, I don't know what to do. I can't lift the dog. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. And it's now our house. <laughs> that's yeah. I've, that's yeah. That's so, that's so scary. I can't believe that just happened to you this like last night and you were doing all these things. How do you do it all? How do you just like get up and then and just keep going after something like that well we never went back to bed i mean you know at that point by the time we got home from the clinic it was 4 30 and i said uh this you know i'll get on the computer i wrote a couple blogs <laughs> I'll just start working. <laughs> yeah i get your emails every every single week do you do you schedule them or how do how do you how do you do that how do you do all of that Oh, I actually, the Friday five, I have to, now I'm going to give away a secret, but, uh, my son's business partner, they're, they're both 29 now, I think, uh, you know, so millennials basically, uh, much better with, uh, 
all this computer stuff that I am. Uh, so he actually writes the Friday Fives. We chat during the week and I give him <laughs> ideas for topics and then he pulls stuff together and he does a phenomenal job. And I sat next to him at an event once and you know the speaker was talking about something we were a little bored with. And I look over and Carlo has his laptop open and literally in five minutes, he just was like moving things around the page and bringing in pictures and, you know, and had this beautiful email ready to go out. And I just went, do you realize that would have taken me about 14 hours? <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Well, that's, that's lucky. That's great. Cause I get those emails. I'm like, Oh, she must, she, she must like just be working all the time. Every, every, well, I am. Yeah. And so, you know, to spend 14 hours on something like that when he can do it in 10 minutes, I'm going to let him do it. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk about, let's talk about your products because I think right. like, this is also something now is, does your, does your son's friend also help with these amazing products or do you have a team that, because these are really high quality, like especially, uh, especially so, this one. <laughs> oh, that. So, yeah, that's our design. Uh -huh. um, so uh, that's our kitty cat cave, but small dogs like it too. Uh, we have those ma handmade in Nepal. Uh, from <laughs> Yeah, they're handmade in Nepal from uh, New Zealand wool. And uh, as a matter of fact, we're waiting for a shipment right now of about 200 of them to come in. Uh, and so my husband and I picked out the colors. He's an artist he's mm -hmm. an architect a retired architect because he's too busy running all my other stuff um and so he picks the color choices <laughs> and the designs and he designs our product labels and the new zealand deer velvet products uh, really came about sort of accidentally i interviewed a man from new zealand who happens to uh, be very active in the deer velvet industry and deer antler velvet for those who are not familiar with it it's a human product as well as, so the tablets and the um, the dental drops have the deer antler velvet in them. And deer antler velvet is the rapid growth phase of the deer antlers. And so it's harvested while it's still in that growth phase and it stimulates stem cells for regeneration and recovery. So athletes, human athletes take deer antler velvet. There's a lot of Olympians that take it my daughter is very active in the Highland game, Scottish Highland games. So, you know, they're the people that throw telephone poles and big rocks. And so she's got all of those athletes taking the human product of that. And it's been awesome, particularly for the senior dogs for mobility. Wow. Yeah, this is so, is this okay to take if they're on um, other medicines or my dog's on Pimo Bendin? Do you think that's okay? It's absolutely fine. All of our dogs are on all the cardiac drugs. Uh -huh. uh, so the ingredients in that senior one, it's uh, the New Zealand deer velvet and uh, it's uh, greenlit mussels, which a lot of people hear about GLM or greenlit mussel for joints. Really awesome. It's a source of omega threes. And then the senior product actually has ginseng in it for brain health. It increases circulation to the brain. And then the dental drops, they're so simple to use. It's just uh, two to four drops on the upper gums on each side once a day. We do it at bedtime. It's got cinnamon and peppermint, and so it'll help dissolve tartar, uh, but also gives them really kissing fresh breath. And when, I don't know about you, but I sleep with a couple dogs on my pillow with their nose in my face, and I, I like the nose end better. Um, and so the drops are a really good thing. <laughs> Amazing. Now, now I have to get something out of my oven because I actually tried one of your recipes and I forgot about it as we started live streaming. <laughs> um, but this is your book. Hold on a second. Do you want to, uh, tell everybody a little bit about your book as I'm getting the, the product out of the sure. oven? <laughs> oh, that's so funny. She's, she's, she's making product as we speak. So this is the book. It's called Yin and Yang Nutrition for Dogs, Maximizing Health with Whole Foods, Not Drugs. And, uh, my favorite part of holistic medicine is actually healing my clients or my patients with food and using food as medicine instead. And I'll use herbs, I use food, but instead of, uh, using drugs and a lot of chemicals for my patients, I would much rather use food. And this is, I know Lauren has a George, the little, uh, black dog on the cover. That is my George. And next to him is Myra, who is sadly no longer with us, but that's little George. And um, he wears his little chef's outfit quite often to, I was just saying, Lauren, this is my George, the little oh, black dog on the cover. Yeah, he's, so cute. He's right here somewhere. Um, so anyway, uh, so what did you make? I made the kale <laughs> chips because I thought it was, the, I'm, not a, I'm not much of a cook. 
So I was, I was also, I was, I was reading, I was reading. It was like, oh, you don't have to be that much of a cook, and they actually are really, really good. Uh, except yeah, they're actually in uh, the green book that you have, the Canine Kitchen Capers. Oh yes. Um, and that one's a fun book because that book has recipe. Actually, the recipes in either of the books could be shared. Uh, that's Georgie also. The <laughs> recipes in either of the books could be shared with so your animals, cute. but the ones that are used for healing have a lot of, you know, liver and heart. Um, but that's cute little Georgie. And so the kale chips were in there because you can share them between you and your dogs. They're really healthy for them. Now, what do you do if your dogs don't like, like my, my dog does not like eating any kinds of vegetables. Like I just, I tried to give it to him and he like was just not, he looked at me like I was crazy. How do you, with, even with the kale chips, even with the kale chips, like in fish so too, he doesn't like. So I don't know. How do you, do you force them to eat it? What do you do? No. I don't force them, but the recipes that are in the yin and yang book can be made in the crock pot or they can be made as a meatloaf Uh and you can serve them raw or you can serve them cooked. But so a lot of our guys, we have an 18 year old dog and a 17 year old dog. One doesn't have any teeth at all. So all of our food, even when we make it in the crock pot, we grind it. So it's kind of run through a food processor. They can't pick the vegetables out when they run through a food processor. <laughs> and most of my diets are pretty meat heavy. So the dogs really like them mm-hmm. because, you know, for them, it's like, oh, look, it's, you know, it's kind of like, oh, I'm eating liver and I'm eating hearts and I'm eating, you know, hamburger and steak and I'm pretty happy. So mm-hmm. the, the amount of vegetable that's in there, they, they just kind of can't pick it out when you do it that way. Gotcha. Now, I've been looking because I, I, when I go to the grocery store, I'm like, I was like, where do you ask them for hearts? Because you don't really see them <laughs> out like there. And I'm like, do they even have them? Like, I kind of feel awkward asking, you know, is there spe- special places to go and get these uh intestines and (laughs) so you can order online believe it or not so we have a place in pittsburgh that's not that far from us but they ship all over the country um and they're called hair today but there are many of these online places where you can order organ meats so you can specifically order chicken hearts or liver hearts or uh, uh, turkey hearts or livers um but if you ask your butcher, I mean, in our regular grocery store, my husband is good <laughs> friends with the butcher now because my husband is the cook in the family and he's always asking for, you know, special cuts of this or that. Um, but sometimes you find them in weird places. Like at Whole Foods, I find liver and heart very commonly in the frozen. That They have a little oh. tiny frozen meat section. Uh, so sometimes there they'll hide things from you. So And it's weird because I, I have had people like there's a story in the canine kitchen capers, the green book. Uh, where somebody like you, she was like, I'm a vegetarian. I don't cook. I don't do meats. I, you know, where do you get organs? And so, you know, there's a story in there about her asking about the organ meat at the grocery store and people looking at her like she had six heads. And she said, I don't even know what I'm talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. You can find them. Awesome. Awesome. And now I love, I love these, this, this blanket is amazing. My dog, ah. my dog, my dog loves it. But he, all, but also these. Like I, when you sent the, when you, I ordered these, and they are like honestly, I never knew there was disposable diapers for dogs because there's so many animals that like. Well, well, those, yeah. So there's disposable. But these are washable. So these uh-huh. are our eco friendly uh, little girl diapers. You can use them <laughs> on boys too, um, but they have the little tail hole and they stay on really well. They come in uh, three packs with really cute colors because we wanted them to feel special. And then the little blankets, um, they're actually uh, waterproof on one side and then fleecy and absorbable. So like, oh, there he is. Hi, buddy. So a lot of the dogs and cats like to sleep on them because the fleece is really soft. So it's a, it's a really nice furniture protector. But we also, uh, our dogs are trained to use them as piddle pads. So if they need to get up in the middle of the night and it's cold out and we don't feel like going outside, it's just like, <laughs> Your piddle pad is down the hall. Go, you know, I'll wash it tomorrow. Uh, We also travel with those piddle pads. So if we stay in a hotel and, you know, it's the middle of the night and we're on the 15th floor and the dog has to pee, I'm like, I'll throw a pee pad down. You can go. It'll be fine. Um, And then they're washable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Is there any like any tricks to training them to go on on those or? (laughs) <laughs> you know what? One of our dogs, uh, little Pookie, who's one of the stars of Breakfast with Spaniels, um, she has never met a piece of carpet that she didn't like. 
And so I, we don't have any carpet in our house. I can't take her anywhere with carpet <laughs> unless she's wearing her little diaper uh, because she absolutely loves carpet. So she started it. So she would run and go on the pee pad and then all the other dogs just followed what she did. Uh, so if you, if you're training puppies and you get, you know, people for years, we've, we've paper trained them. Well, now we can train them to something that's eco-friendly and we don't have all this waste. <laughs> We're just getting some comments. Uh, her social is uh, Judy Morgan um, DMV, DVM. DVM yes, on Facebook. On Facebook, if, if you want to follow her. You're also on Instagram as Dr. Judy Morgan. Hopefully yes. I tagged the, the... Yeah, they don't match. I'm sorry. I, I messed up. <laughs> <laughs> now, I got some questions because I shared this in one of the groups I'm in, and I got a, a, a few questions, so I'm just going to try to try to go through them real quick because I promised I would answer I would answer them for you for them is that okay sure so Glenda Oates ask would you okay um my question would be how to tell if your babies are in kidney failure and when they are on the fluid tablets uh, my other one would be what biscuits are the best uh so when you have an animal with kidney problems that's a water problem mm -hmm. so it's more moisture in, more moisture out, keeps things flowing, keeps everything cleaned out of the body. So if you're going to make treats, um, I actually recommend giving high moisture treats. So slices of apple or pear, if your dog will eat something like that, blueberries, melons, we want things with a lot of moisture. If you're going to use biscuits, I love to make my own. I use um, things that are hypoallergenic. So I use like coconut flour and pumpkin and unsweetened applesauce. And you can, the, there's recipes for treats in the books. Um, and so an animal that's in kidney failure, we want them to eat a high moisture diet. So if they're, if they've been eating a dry kibble, we want to send that down the road and put them on something that's really high moisture, make sure they're getting a lot of fluids in and out and ways to tell that they're in kidney failure. You can really only tell with, uh, blood work and urinalysis testing, but a lot of times the first symptoms will be, you'll notice they're drinking more than usual. They might have worse breath than usual. They might be losing some weight or backing off on their food a little bit. Yeah. I also, I, I forget cause I read all, of, I was, I was going through your books fast cause I just got them last week. So I, I saw there, there was a, a page on tongues and is that it, can yeah. you tell from, from the color of their tongue? And then I was, I was just looking at the color of, of my dog's tongue and I'm like, well, I can't, how do you, how do you tell what color it is? Like, is it? <laughs> so, uh, so it's really great that you happen to be wearing kind of a dark maroonish shirt and these beautiful bubblegum pink headphones. <laughs> so, if your dog's tongue is that dark red that your shirt is, that is a lot of heat and inflammation. And that's almost what I call toxic red. And believe it or not, I see dogs with that maroon tongue. And very commonly, that's a dog who's got some sort of a cancer somewhere. Oh, wow. So if, if you're looking in, actually, that's how I diagnosed uh, the lung cancer in our Cocker Spaniel that we lost in October. <sighs> we came home from a three-week vacation, and I looked at her, and I said, when did your tongue turn that color? And she had zero symptoms, no coughing, nothing. Ran lab work, perfectly normal. And I said, well, I still know there's something wrong, so we're going to x-ray the dog from one end to the other. And she was loaded. She probably had 15 tumors in there. Oh, my god! And the gosh. only way I knew that was because her tongue turned that color. So if you have multiple dogs in the house, it's worth looking, comparing. Uh -huh. um, and you'll, you'll see. And it's really interesting. When I first learned this, I went around to all of my friends because it holds mm -hmm. true with people as well. I went around to all my friends and I was like, stick your tongue out, stick your tongue out, stick your tongue out. And every morning when I get up, I stick my tongue out and I kind of see what kind of a day it's going to be. Oh my goodness. That's so, that's so, I kind of want to show you George's tongue right now. I'm like. Well, if, if you can, George, actually you don't have here. You don't have to crank open his mouth. You just have to lift his lip on the side so I can see where it sticks between his uh, Here, teeth. Let me let me get him again. Okay. <laughs> George left. <laughs> okay. I think my George left too. <laughs> How do we see my, this? my George said, I don't think so. Okay. Open your mouth. Do you see it? No. Okay. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Did you see it? Yep. Well, so he's more on the pale side. He's actually paler than your headphones. Uh huh. Um, and uh, so <laughs> let's talk about where George. I don't even. I, I know that George. You found me on a heart page, so I'm assuming yeah. George had from Pimabendon, so he's got yeah. some heart problems. Uh, what is George eating? 
George, I cook for him, so either okay. just meat, meat, and and I and dry food sometimes. Cause like if I just give him like he would like to eat just steak every day, but then his his poop is liquidy, so that's the <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah. So he's gonna need some carbs in there as well. And uh, so you live in California. Is it warm where you are all the time? Well, it's much? like it's like fifty five actually. It's been colder here. Okay. It's been colder. So which does he prefer? Does he prefer the warm weather or the cool weather? I don't know. See, he got he had an ep- I don't know if it was an episode or if it was kennel cough when we were in Miami. So it was like a little bit more humid. So okay. I I don't know if if he which which one he prefers if he likes it here better. I I can't tell. He likes Where does he sleep? He sleeps in bed with me <laughs> next to my pillow. Snuggle up or does he get too hot if he's close to you? Sometimes it's it's because I move around. So sometimes he'll get annoyed if I'm moving and sit by my feet. But then most of the time now, like now, like that now that he's older, when he was younger, he would just like jump off the bed and be away from me. Okay. But now he's like coming closer to me. Okay, yeah. So his tongue is a little pale. And so just based on this quick conversation, I would say that he's a little bit of a cold dog which means he's a little young deficient. So mm-hmm. when you read the book, you'll find things. For, and he's probably chi deficient. Well, we know he's heart chi deficient. Uh-huh. So chi is energy. And his heart energy doesn't work well. That's why he's on Pema Because um, that's that's replacing his heart energy. It's giving him his heart chi back. So if I were going to pick recipes out of the book for him, I would pick a heart chi tonic diet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would pick diets that are more warming for uh-huh. him um and i can probably give you a page number if i look real <laughs> fast yeah he has a murmur so i was reading the story yeah. about i think it was in the needles to to needles natural, natural about delilah about, about yeah. delilah and it was just like oh my god it was so sad All right, page 115 is the heart chi tonic diet and i love these book i love these um these book these uh what are they called oh the bookmarks bookmarks that's right bookmarks 112 amazing uh, 115 115 awesome yeah it's it's so now when you say a lot of the stuff were fed raw do you just give them the meat raw is that what that means because i was always confused yeah. by raw cooking so a lot of people <laughs> <laughs> raw cooking a lot of people <laughs> eat raw we most our dogs mostly eat raw food sometimes we cook it but mostly they eat raw so i would take all those ingredients that are there on that page which is uh chicken gizzards uh chicken hearts um, chicken liver, butternut squash, kale, mushrooms, and some fennel. I would take all that and I would run it through our, our food grinder and mm-hmm. I would grind it all up. So it's, it looks like hamburger with some stuff in it when you're done. And we can just put that in the bowl and our guys are used to raw food. So they'll eat it raw. Oh, wow. Uh, not all dogs like raw food. My mom's dog hates raw food. She, hers has to be cooked. She will not touch it raw. Some of them don't like the texture. Uh huh. Okay, we got some more questions. Um, Patsy Knott said, I would like to know what to feed Pippa as she now has badly damaged liver and her kidneys are not good. And I think different diets will help. Absolutely. So depending on how advanced the liver and kidney damage are, uh, that's going to determine how much we need to modify the diet for the dog. The liver is, um, it's, from a Chinese medicine standpoint, it is the organ of spring and it likes green. So in order to support the liver, we want to feed dark leafy greens. So kale, dandelion greens, uh, spinach are excellent, broccoli. And then we also need to feed liver blood, uh, the blood of the liver. Uh, so sardines are excellent for that. And those are also excellent for the kidneys. Eggs are excellent for the liver and the kidneys. And then I would probably add something like cooked oats or cooked barley. Uh, We're going to need to lower the protein content just a little bit, depending on where uh, that dog is in in its progression of disease. Um, And in that yin and yang book, there is a chapter in the back called The Balancing Act. And that talks about if your pet is only on home-cooked diets, you want to make sure they're getting all the vitamins and minerals that they need. So it tells you how to make sure that you're getting all that in there. Now, also in this, I, I just, I've been going through your books and, and I think it was from, from needles to, to natural. There's a ton of supplements listed on there. Like, uh, I think it was like, uh, tor- taurine and, and co enzyme, what, you know, whatever, whatever. I'm not. Yeah. So this book, um, this one was written about five 
almost five years ago, four and a half. Um, and this one, uh, it's divided by different diseases and how they're diagnosed and how they're treated, how they would be treated traditionally, and then supplements and things that we would add from a holistic standpoint to try to keep the medications at a slightly lower level, keep them healthy along a more natural route. So, you know, you're probably referencing the chapter on heart disease. And so there are things that absolutely will decrease the inflammation and decrease the symptoms and problems associated with heart disease. So we use high doses of omega-3 fatty acids. So that's fish oil. We use coenzyme Q10 or uh, sometimes called quercetin, uh, sometimes a little bit of magnesium, uh, Hawthorn can be used. The dandelion greens are really good. So in this book, we talk about all the different foods that you could use for each organ system. But then in the other book, in the yin and yang, we actually made recipes. <laughs> so for those of you who, I, so I'm one of those cooks that I'm just like, oh, a little of this and a pinch of that. And I just throw it all in the pot and I look, you know, like, yay, I'm done. Um, most people need a recipe. And they want to know, no, I need to know it's three teaspoons of this and two ounces of that. And yeah, so that's why we made that second book where people can get that information. <laughs> now, all of these. Uh, so is there any I, I know you recommended it was like one, uh, I guess, a medicine that, that puts them has a lot of this um, heart kind of stuff together in it. Is there? Yeah. What, so there, there was one from ANT. That's probably the one animal nutrition technologies. Mm -hmm. And that one is off the market. Now that's oh. the problem with uh, giving brand names in books. There are other brands out there. Vetra science has a, a cardio something or other, but there's quite a few that are on the market. Mm -hmm. um, and people send me emails all the time with, Hey, I found this supplement. What do you think of this one? And sometimes you know, sometimes I know I'm familiar with it and I can give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Other times I'm not familiar with it. And so I, I, I'm happy to look them up because I learn every time I have to look up a different supplement. And then, I, you know, sometimes I go, oh, I really like that one. I'm going to add that to the list. So, uh, you know, people are welcome to, mm -hmm. to contact me through Facebook or social media or even through my website, which is just drjudymorgan.com. Um, and, you know, if they have questions about particular supplements, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, just send me a link. So it makes it really easy for me to, you know, click and go. Um, and I can give you a yes or a no. Now, are all these, are all these safe to have with Pimobendin or other, uh, heart kind of medicines that people might be on or how does that work? For the most part? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so the CoQ10, like all of our dogs are uh -huh. on Pimobendin. Some of them are also on Sildenafil for pulmonary hypertension. They're on Lasix. One is on Torsamide, which is even stronger than Lasix. Um, they are getting their senior wellness formula, which is my uh, brand that you have. They're getting omega-3 fatty acids. They're getting CoQ10. And we, about a year ago, added CBD oil into their regimen, which I love. Um, particularly since they're older, they're getting arthritic, uh, the heart disease, the mitral valve disease is an inflammatory condition and the CBD helps with that. So uh, all of that is safe. Now there are a few herbs that we have to be a little bit careful with. So Hawthorne is an herb that we are a little careful. Uh, golden paste, which is made with turmeric, can uh, act as a little bit as a blood thinner. So it's only a problem if they're going in for a major surgery. So uh, Nate Estes, who lives out near you, just had his dog in Japan having uh, heart open heart surgery for re repair of the valve. It was her second time going through it. Wow, with uh, the same did, dog or? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, she had surgery, I think, two years ago. Wow. And then she had ruptured one of, and she did great. And then she ruptured one of the little tendons inside the heart that holds the heart muscle from falling apart. And so they basically rushed her back over to Japan, had a second repair done. Uh, she just got back home and is doing really well. Wow, that's amazing. What kind of dog was it? She is a Maltese, mm -hmm. I believe. Uh -huh. um, so the, the, the surgery that's being, the open heart surgery is being done in Japan and in France. Yeah, my, my, my best friend went to France and the dog didn't make it. I felt so bad. Oh, oh that's so horrible. Awful. You know, they're, they're, um, their rate of success is really high, uh -huh. really, 
Yeah, uh, I asked Nate when he was in Japan because we had thought about it for Pookie, and I, I just thought, oh my gosh, if she didn't make it, I would be so devastated. And he said their success rate is something like 97%. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculously high. Yeah, that so, doctor is supposed to be amazing. He is amazing. He's the guy who started the whole thing. It's Dr. Ueki over in Japan, and uh, he started the whole thing. And uh, that group, it, for people who have dogs with mitral valve disease and might be interested in the surgery, on Facebook, it's the Mighty Hearts group. Mm -hmm. uh, Nate Estes run it, runs it, and he's just a wealth of information. He's He just wants to be able to help other people. It is ridiculously expensive um but it will save lives mm -hmm. so and i'm sorry your friend's dog didn't, didn't make it it's yeah. amazing how many uh clients i have now whose dogs have had the surgery oh yeah and it's been good they all but japan or france or where both. both i've got them from both and i only have had one client come in uh their dog made it through the surgery but died about a month oh. later uh they think she threw a blood clot about oh. a month later wow. but uh for the most part people have been really really happy with it now do you think how many if they get the surgery how many years after the surgery do you think the valves will last or is there a way to tell or i don't you know i don't know if nate has statistics on that or not mm -hmm. and actually um we think that they're going to start doing the surgery at the vet school in florida in gainesville uh so that will be amazing and i mean it's still going to be expensive but you don't have to go to japan for two weeks yeah uh, or france <laughs> uh so you don't have that added expense um i don't really know uh, -huh. uh it definitely shrinks the heart back toward normal size most mm -hmm. of these dogs six to 12 months after surgery their hearts are back to functioning really really well uh-huh so i think you would have to weigh you know what's the age of the dog nate's dog is pretty young so what's the age of the dog versus mm -hmm. the stage of the disease um you know pookie's 13 at this point mm -hmm. uh if we had surgery you know, she might make it three more years if we don't have, she's been on heart meds since 2012. Uh huh. I figure we're seven years in. I'm just keeping my fingers crossed. Uh -huh. <laughs> did she have, uh, did, did she have a, a murmur or what was the, how did they? Huh. So it was interesting with Pookie. She had uh, like a grade one or two murmur uh -huh. and she blew out her ACL ligament in her back leg. We had three dogs blow out their ACLs a month apart from each other, just running across the backyard. Kaboom. Oh and uh, so she went in and had surgery and about a month after surgery, that murmur went to a four. Like it, that surgery just threw her over the edge, just blew it out. Um, and so she started seeing the cardiologist at that point and, uh, -huh. uh she was not symptomatic, but when I listened to her, I said, Oh, that's crazy. And so she saw the cardiologist and started on meds right away. Wow. Wow. All right. So let's, we're going to get back to, to some of these questions and then I'm, I, I have a few questions. I know I don't want to keep you too long cause uh, it's, you have a lot going on. Um, Roberta Leonard said, um, she just wants to know the best diet for a dog with CHF that also is protective for a kidney. And I think, I mean, it's all, all in your book. There are good recipes in there. And on my website, I have a video. It's also on YouTube. It's kind of all over the place. It's kind of gone worldwide for pup loaf. And pup loaf is kind of my, my base. Um, so on my website, there's about a 30 minute video on us making pup loaf and talking about the different ingredients and why we use them. The pup loaf recipe is on the website. It's in the book. Um, and that can be modified for different things, but that diet I originally made be to be heart healthy for all of our old guys. Mm -hmm. Um, because we've got a lot of heart disease in this house cause we have Cavaliers. <laughs> They're so cute. Oh, my goodness. And I saw I read in your book because I have one of my friends has a Cavalier I love. And I saw the little earmuffs and I said, oh, my God, that is genius that on, on Etsy that you said. I don't oh, know. If they... Yeah, they're snoods. They're yeah. called snoods. I don't know and if you'd wear it. They're, they're but little I'm like, hats. Yeah. Uh, it, it keeps their ears out of their food because I really like them to have the long ears. So a lot of people, they trim the ears short to keep them out of the food. And if they're eating raw food or home cooked stews, it's sloppy food. And let me tell you, they get it in their ears and then all day long, they're chewing on the end of their ears because they've got food. You know, it's like, you know, guys with mustaches and beards. <laughs> <they're food> there. <laughs> uh, Karen Peters said, same, what's the best way to prevent kidney failure? The best way to prevent kidney failure is to keep them on a high moisture diet for their entire life. Mm -hmm. Never feed dry food. Uh -huh. It's it really it's a convenience for us. It's not good for our pets. Uh -huh. It really is not. Um, 
so that's one of the things. And then uh, other things, uh, kidney failure is basically an inflammatory disease. I mean, it's a normal aging process. So we've got an 18 year old dog, although his kidneys are still 100 percent. He's 18 with uh, actually all of our guys, their kidney function is great. Uh, they have been on either raw or home cooked meals for the past 10 to 12 years. Dry food never enters my house. It's not healthy for them. Um, and, you know, so keeping those kidneys happy, one of the things that we see in traditional medicine when dogs age, the veterinarians will say, oh, we need to really restrict their protein. We, res we end up restricting their protein too much and that causes more issues for them. They start losing muscle mass. They'll start losing their body mass. They lose their energy. So our guys have stayed on their, their high meat diets right on through. Um, we are just starting to add some more carbs in the form of a little bit of potato for our 18 year old because he kind of needs it to keep his stool glued together. And that's the only reason we're using it. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise our guys are not big drinkers that if you have a dog that is on a high moisture diet, they will not drink a lot of water and that's normal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, Sh Sarah Aston Grove said, this is amazing. Can't wait to hear her. <laughs> <laughs> Lois, uh, Lois Patty Weiglin said, I would appreciate her opinion on vet med Pimo Bended due to the vet med in shortage. Many people have been getting Pimo Bended from compounding pharmacies. Some have said their dogs tolerate it well. Others have said it isn't the same and to stick with vet Menden. For me, one vet said to get vet Menden whenever possible. Another vet said the compound is fine. I would like to know what she recommends. You know, that is a really interesting question. And I just taped a radio show yesterday with a compounding pharmacist from a new a compounding pharmacy in New York City. And I asked him that very exact same <laughs> question. And I said, you know, it's been running around social media that some people are getting really upset and saying the compounding pimabendin does not work as well. And our dogs have been on compounded for a very long time because they're on weird dosing. And so splitting up the pills all the time, it was just a pain with multiple dogs on it. And the answer to that is it has to, the pimabendin has to be mixed with something else for good absorption. And so the vetmedin has that in there. And if your compounding pharmacist is not aware of that and is just throwing pimabendin powder in the capsule, you're not getting good absorption rates. He would not tell me what that ingredient was because he <laughs> said that's proprietary, but a good compounding pharmacist is going to know what they need to do for good absorption on that. Um, we are getting ours from Wedgwood Pharmacy in New Jersey, and I've been very happy with it. Uh, we're getting it in a capsule form. Um, the pharmacy that I talked to yesterday is MixLab. Uh, it's MixLabRx.com in New York City. So uh, they are awesome. They only ship to the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut region, uh, but they will answer questions. They are awesome. They, so you can go to their website, you can email them, text them, call them, and they'll answer questions for you uh, and you know help you find out whether the one that you're getting compounded is the level that it needs to be for the absorption. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's all. That's that's interesting because yeah, because George was on a compound and he was just throwing up. I had to take him to my vet, and they gave him some injection for nausea. And I'm like, oh god. Oh, right. So yeah. now it's you know a, a pill to treat the side effects and yeah. the other pill and antacids. Yeah, ours, and I was like, oh. Yeah, ours I haven't had a problem at all, and I will tell you that vetminin is really hard to get. So, as a veterinarian, our clinic I have two clinics, and we're limited to five bottles a month. Wow. Well, that won't even do my dogs, let alone any of my patients. <laughs> so we have to find a way around it. Uh huh. Uh, so, so for somebody to say, well, you have to use Vetminin, well, your dog's going to go without because it's really hard to get. Really hard. Wow. Wow. Well, hopefully, hopefully that fixed that they, we get more of it because, because, yeah. <laughs> Um, We're hoping. Yeah. So my dog, he always chews his paws. And before his heart issues, my, my vet told me, you know, to switch to just duck food or, you know, limit uh, dog food with limited ingredients. And I tried that and he still just chews his paws. Like, so he's either got environmental allergies. So he's allergic to grass or, mm -hmm. you know, something in your carpets or a cleaning product, or it can be food allergies. Now, food allergies 
tend to also have symptoms other than the biting the paws, although not necessarily. If you're getting little cysts in between the toes, that's generally a food allergy. Mm -hmm. If you're getting yeasty ears, that's a food allergy. If they're itchy in the face, that's a food allergy. Itchy paws, maybe, maybe not. Um, but we do definitely need to have a healthy gut. So I just wrote a blog on this that's on my website last week on, uh, you know, you can't just go from one dry kibble to another, even if you go to limited ingredients. So saying, okay, well, I'm going to switch from, you know, this kind of generic kibble to a duck and sweet potato kibble probably isn't going to work. There's still too many ingredients in there. Uh, the other problem that we have is a lot of those limited ingredient diets are made with peas or potatoes as, as the starch. And we are having a huge issue right now with dilated cardiomyopathy secondary to the grain-free diets. And we don't understand why it's happening, but I do not recommend just having your dog on a grain-free dry kibble. Uh, because because of the problems that we're seeing. And, and let's face it, we already have dogs with heart problems. I sure don't want to make them worse. Yeah. What about, so no n no peas in general, you don't include in any food or you think peas are bad? I, or I, don't, like are bad? Peas. I don't like peas for dogs. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like starches. So I don't use beans. I, you know, a string bean is fine. Uh -huh. you know, that's, a, that's a green bean. That's not a starchy bean. Uh, lima beans, black beans, kidney beans. Uh, I don't like those for our dogs or for cats. And so I don't like potatoes. I will occasionally use sweet potatoes, but I tend to go more to the squash family. So I'll use butternut squash or pumpkin. Mm -hmm. And when you see my recipes and you look through the pictures in the book, I like to say that I like to color the rainbow. So when I'm going through the grocery store and I'm picking out the ingredients to make food for my dogs, I'm like, oh, look at that nice, bright orange butternut squash. Look, there's a nice yellow squash. Oh, there's a nice, bright egg yolk that's bright yellow. Oh, here's my green. I'm going to get a broccoli or a kale. And I will just, you know, go around the store and pick things. I use cranberries mm -hmm. I, or beets. I get the red in there. And I just go around the store and I'm like, let me get a rainbow in my basket. And then it's like, all right, good. We're going to add some meat and some organs and <laughs> seems like a lot of a lot of time now a couple <laughs> a couple of more questions um so uh when you freeze your raw food you you take it out and you you put it in the grinder when you're we're making it for them do you let it like get because i read in your book you have it everything should be room temperature a little bit warm for their bodies or for his i guess when you feed it yeah 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 when you feed it so uh we when we grind food we grind about 100 pounds at a time because oh, we're wow. feeding it <laughs> our dogs have two freezers and their own refrigerator. They actually have their own kitchen because uh, we, are, we are crazy dog people. Um, so we grind about 100 pounds at a time, and that's still only going to last us a couple of weeks. Uh, and then we put it in little one-pound containers, and we put those in the freezer. And I'll thaw out enough to last two to three days at a time. And then I'll take that container, and uh, if I'm if I'm not uh, being worried about the microwave that day, I might warm it up in the microwave. <laughs> uh, sometimes we will add really hot water to it, just to so I take it out of the refrigerator, put it in their bowl, and then I'll add enough really hot water, as in like boiling hot water, to just bring it up to temperature. That actually steers it a little bit as well if you're worried about feeding raw and the bacteria. Mm -hmm. uh, but even if it's cooked, uh, so you just add enough water to to stir it around and not make it hot. We don't want it hot, but we don't want it to be a cold shock to the digestive tract. Okay. And really that holds true for people. That's why in Europe they drink their beer warm because they're smart enough to know that ice, that nobody puts ice in their drinks. Uh, you're not supposed to eat cold food and you're not supposed to drink cold things. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. For people too. It's, it's yeah. interesting. It's <laughs> so interesting. You go to China, there's no ice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, where do you do your seminars? Because I, I, I read that you do seminars where, you know, would you put that on your website? Where can people find or, you know, see the best place to find them? I will list events on my, uh, Facebook page. We used to have a calendar on the website and that plugin somehow died. Um, but I do announce them on my Facebook page and then there's an events page on there. Um, so seminars are kind of all over the place. I know we will be in Ontario, Canada for Memorial Day weekend. Uh, in uh, next weekend, we are be in Chantilly, Virginia at the Super Pets Expo. I will be speaking down at Global Pet in Orlando the following week. 
Uh, we are all over the place. We're scheduling one uh, in Hollywood, Florida oh. uh, for next January. Uh, it's January 11th. We have one in just outside of Atlanta, Georgia on September 7th, I want to say. Uh, but we post them as we go along. And frankly, anyone who wants me to come put on a seminar you do the work, I show up. So <laughs> you can email me and say, hey, look, I would love to get 25 to 50 people together in Hollywood, California. And <laughs> I've got a place where we can have it and you know, we'll sell the tickets and, and I'll come. So uh, you know, we can do them anywhere. We're, uh, we're going to Michigan as well in October, I believe. That's, that's amazing, that's amazing. Now, heartworm, because you, uh, when I go back to the to the East Coast, my vet yelled at me. He's like, "You have to give him the heartworm pills." And but I'm I'm always just scared. What do you What do you think about that, or do you? Ah, uh, this is this is tricky to put this out out in the world. Uh, I have not given our dogs heartworm preventative uh, the last two summers, so there were year three. Um, but heartworms, frankly, are not as big a deal here as uh, they are in other parts of the country. So we see if we diagnose one or two cases a year between my two hospitals, that's a lot. So it's really low incidence. Most of the cases that we see are dogs that are coming up from the South. So it's rescue dogs that are being brought up from South Carolina, Louisiana, Mississippi. Those dogs are coming up positive because they don't get good care down there. So if I lived in that area of the country, you know, the Southeast and, you know, Texas and Panhandle or, or uh, uh, Louisiana, that area, I, I would think about it differently uh, mm. for the Northern States. A lot of people are not giving it, or if we, for my patients, for people who are worried, we give it seasonally. Mm -hmm. So we give it from June to October in New Jersey. So mm -hmm. it just depends where you are. And there is information on that in the, from needles to natural book. I talk a lot about my favorite heartworm preventative. I also have a ton of blogs on that. If you are not going to give heartworm preventative at all, it is recommended that you do the heartworm blood test minimum of twice a year, because if they should develop an adult worm in the heart, you want to find out quickly so that you can take care of it quickly before it becomes uh, blown out of proportion. And it takes about six months for the heartworm life cycle to uh, take effect. So twice a year, at least testing. Um, now, some, uh, Gracie asked neutering. She has an, an older dog. Should she neuter the dog? Is it still Only if there's a health reason to uh -huh. neuter them. So it used to be, you know, veterinarians as a whole just said six months, we spay and neuter everybody. Mm -hmm. We've changed that. Or at least the holistic veterinarians have changed <laughs> that. So the boys, we are, I have my first ever intact male dog in this house. And <laughs> when we adopted him last summer and I took him in and I did his dental, I mean, I was all set to neuter him. And I, I said, no, wait a minute. Why am I doing, there's no reason to. Uh, so for the males, it's, you know, they can't get pregnant accidentally. You got to make sure they're not breeding your neighbor's dog accidentally. Uh, <laughs> but it really is better for them to keep the hormones for the females. There's a fine line somewhere. And we don't know where that fine line is between we want them to reach full maturity. So for most of my patients, for the females, we're waiting until they're two years old because we want all of their bones to be completely developed before we would consider. So one of the things that we have found in studies with golden retrievers and Rottweilers is that early spay neuter contributes to hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, and cancer. Wow. So that's why we're waiting for them to reach full maturity and get those bones completely done their growth phase. Uh, so for most of them, we're spaying at around two years of age. And we're, we're doing that because at some point, the risk of an infection in the uterus and mammary cancer then start to outweigh the risk of the joint problems. So there's a fine line. I don't know exactly where that is, but we're trying to wait until two years old if I have a responsible pet owner. <laughs> uh, and then for the little boys, you know, as long as, you know, they're good citizens, they can keep theirs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, going through this, um, the, now, now I know you said you recommend food on your website. So is there any dry foods you would recommend or no? Really not. I really <laughs> So for those who want convenience factor, freeze dried. Uh -huh. There are freeze dried products. So Dr. Harvey's, um, Sojo's, uh, Honest Kitchen. There's a million of them out there now. And then there's also the freeze dried raws like Primal and Stella and Chewy's and uh, oh my gosh, Vital Essentials. There's so many of them out there. So that's convenient. You pour it out of the bag and add water. Uh -huh. Like it's not any harder. 
<laughs> it's really no harder. You have to add water, but it's not hard. So a lot of times when we're traveling in the motorhome, I mean, I've got a refrigerator, I've got a kitchen, but you know, if I'm staying in a hotel and I need something easy, I'll take that freeze dried bag with me. It's easy to throw in the suitcase. It doesn't weigh anything and I can always get hot water. So that's a really easy way to do it. So really there's no excuse to have to feed kibble because there's other things that are just as convenient and 10 times healthier. Now, vitamin D, do you always give it to your dogs or cats or how do you? <laughs> well, so that depends for my guys that are on home cooked. Uh, yes, we're, we're adding vitamin D and you have to be very careful. So there was just this huge recall that started back in November and is kind of still going on for excess vitamin D in canned and dry commercial products from some of the big pet food companies. And we got pretty angry and I am going to name names because Hills waited until the end of January to do their recall when everybody else did their recall in November. And they are now subject to many, many, many lawsuits because many pets died during that three month period when clearly there was a problem. So um, you don't want to just start throwing vitamin D and you cannot use human vitamin D supplements because they are way too strong. I have a friend in Israel who almost killed her dogs by supplementing human vitamin D and they all went into kidney failure. So you have to be careful. You have to use products that are the right strength. So our dogs use the RX vitamins, vitamin D3. It's on my website if you want to look at it. Um, but they're small dogs. They get three drops per day. So it's very little that they need, but it's very important that they get that little bit and particularly for dogs with heart disease. Mm -hmm. So, but the best way to do it is to actually have a test run, find out where their vitamin D level is. So because of this recall and all these foods that were so high in vitamin D, I was having sick dogs come in the office and I said, well, let's just check their vitamin D and make sure that's not a problem. Shockingly to me, and these were all on commercial pet foods from big companies, they all came back low, every single one of them. Now those pet food companies tell us that those foods are 100% complete and balanced, yet none of them are because all of those dogs came back low. So the best way is to test mm -hmm. and then treat as needed. Now for George, he's just on the Pimo Bendin because I was scared to add any other supplements. What's a good way to, to start giving them supplements? Also, you know, do you do you give them the medicine when they're before they eat, after they eat? What are your tips on that? So it kind of depends on what the supplement is. And I will tell you that we have seven dogs in the house and they're eating pretty much seven different meals. Like everybody's got a different <laughs> meal in their bowl and each one of them is on probably 10 to 15 different medications or supplements by the time we're done with everything. So because that's a little bit crazy. Like if you could see the picture of the bottles lined up on their counter uh, and their bowls, um, I throw absolutely everything in their bowl. And I know that my supplements on the label, it says, you know, give an hour before feeding. Yeah, I throw it in the bowl because I just don't have time to say, okay, well you get this one an hour before and you get that one an hour after. And you know, I, we'd spend all day just trying to get pills in the dogs. We can't. So <laughs> I throw everything in the bowl. <laughs> So it kind of depends. There are some drugs like thyroid medications definitely absorb better mm -hmm. when given before or after meals. Uh, Dr. Gene Dodds definitely recommends give your thyroid pill in the morning, an hour before food, and then in the evening, an hour after the food. Um, again, my dog that's on thyroid medicine, it goes in his bowl. So he probably doesn't have optimal absorption, but his test is okay. So I'm okay. Gotcha. And now, so if I want to start giving him the pills, it's fine just to give it to him when he eats. Yeah. Like, and you know, should you start with all of the enzymes and everything at once or should you do, you know, I gen, you know, it kind of depends. Like if I, somebody come in for a consultation and, and I'm sending them home with 17 different things, <laughs> I generally would say, you know what, this one's the safest one to start first. Just start this, you know, give it a few days, see if you get any changes in appetite, bowels, anything. And bring them on slowly, kind of one at a time. Mm -hmm. So the two that you have there, the wellness and the senior, mm -hmm. they have very similar ingredients. Now your dog's a small dog, mm -hmm. he is a senior dog. But I would start with the wellness, the small bottle, uh -huh. one a day. Uh -huh. uh, and give that for a week or two. And if he's doing fine with that, then you can add in the senior one. Gotcha. Some of the ingredients in there are similar, mm -hmm. uh, but it's fine. And he's only going to need one a day of each one. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the big difference is the senior one has that ginseng for the uh, circulation to the brain. And mm -hmm. then the uh, wellness formula has colostrum for the immune system. Amazing. Now, and, and if I also want to start him on, like you said, there was like a, the, if I find a, a supplement that's good for the, the heart. Right. Yeah. So if you find like the uh, Vetro Science Cardio yeah. Plus or uh, Thorn, I think makes, there's a bunch of them out there. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Just add one thing at a time uh -huh. and just make sure that you don't get any bowel changes, upset stomach, backing uh -huh. off the food. Uh, most of the, my two are a chewable treat. Some dogs love them. Some hate them. Cats love them because they have the green lip muscle and cats kind of like that smell. I mean, when you open them they're they definitely smell fishy. Uh -huh. uh, so if George doesn't like fish, he may not like them. Um, but I have one guy who doesn't like fish, but he thinks those are okay. So <laughs> it's every dog's different. You can always wrap them in a little cream cheese. And I do not like peanut butter for dogs, but almond butter is fine. Okay. And uh, the CBD oil, when do you give them <laughs> that? Or like, do you give it to them at night after all their pills? Or is that a morning thing? Again, I'm throwing it in the food. Uh -huh. And some people say it absorbs better if you give it separately and put it in the mouth directly. Again, too many dogs, too many things that are going into them. And so it's going in their bowls. Now we have our 18 year old has a, a neurologic problem that sometimes is worse at night and the CBD really helps. So sometimes he gets an extra dose at bedtime and that's just going directly in his mouth. Um, and we're using that for cancer, for arthritis, for seizures, for anxiety, for uh, a lot of inflammatory problems. So I'm just a huge fan of mm -hmm. CBD oil. You want to you want to make sure that you're using a good quality product. Uh, there's a million of them coming online, and mm -hmm. it, it gets hard after a while to kind of filter through. Um, if you want to see what my favorite ones are, just go to my website. I've got mm -hmm. three different companies on there. So you'll know which ones are my favorites because those are the ones I chose. <laughs> and now do you do you get special ones for dogs or would you not give them human ones or for CBD? No, the one, all three of the ones that we chose are all human grade and uh -huh. all three of those companies have them. Uh, it's frankly the same exact thing in the bottle, just a different label. Uh -huh. And then how much would so, you give to a 25 pound dog? two and a half milligrams twice a day. Uh -huh. So the, the CBD oil is generally dosed at one milligram per 10 pounds of body weight. Okay. So for 25 pound dog, two and a half milligrams. Um, and how and do you, the different like, frames, you just have the dropper. How do you measure? I'm not, you know, I don't, how do you measure how many so, milligrams it is? Uh, there, it's really weird the way that they label CBD oil. So on my website, you'll see that there's a bottle that has 90 milligrams, one with 250, a 500, a thousand, and a 2000. So the 250, well, let's go with the 90. The 90 milligram, one dropper, one full dropper of the bottle is three milligrams. So you would just need a little less than a full dropper. Um, if we went to the next size up, you would need about a third of a dropper. So, but it, on the side of the bottles, it says exactly how much it is per drop. Gotcha. So, and how much per dropper. Uh -huh. So it, it's a little easier to do the math, but I will tell you <laughs> that more people are math challenged than I realize. I get emails every day. I can't figure out how many drops of this to give to my dog because the way they label it is very confusing. So, you know, people just send me an email and they go, okay, this is the strength <laughs> I have. This is the size of my dog. And I go, okay, this many drops. And so if you need to do that, if you're math challenged, that's fine. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Now, um, how do you determine how many, this is next math question. How many, cause I, cause this book tells you how many ounces, do you have a special right. scale that tells you how many ounces or. So you can do that, you know, like a, a, a measuring cup, a cup is eight ounces. Uh huh. Half cup is four ounces. Okay. So just use your measuring cup. <laughs> you might have to look it up online. It's okay. You can do your conversions <laughs> online or you can weigh it on a scale. Okay. So you can, do, you can do it as a liquid measure in a cup or you can do it on a scale. Uh huh. Now I, I'm so, I know we have maybe two more minutes, so I'm just going to go through this really quickly. Now the, the, there's, I, I love your book so much because it tells you about how your dog, I, I, and I'm, I'm probably going to describe this wrong to the viewers, but it has different kinds of, it's like my dog, I felt like was two of them though. I felt like he was fire and water. Maybe you can explain to, to everybody and, and why they should get this book. So, because I was looking up your recipes before, but now having the book, I'm like, oh wow, this actually like explains, there's like so much more to it that I don't quite understand, but maybe you can right. dive into it. So our dogs and us, we all, there's five Chinese personalities, fire, water, metal, earth, and wood. 
And so the book kind of tells you, and on my website, there's the pet personality quiz. It's a free download. <laughs> so go drjudymorgan.com, go in the store and look for the pet personality quiz. It's I'm a gonna, free download. I didn't know that. I'm going to do that now. I'm excited. <laughs> well, I, I have to let out a secret. That page was supposed to be in the book and somehow got left out. So I made it a free download so that people can get it. <laughs> uh, but the, it helps you decide and you will find that your dog is a little of this and a little of this. You can't be, we can't either. You can't be all of one thing. You'll be a majority, but you can't be all of one thing. So your guy probably started out, since you're saying he's fire and water, probably started out as a fire. And now as he's getting older, water is kind of the uh, old, old person. <laughs> Sorry, one of my dogs is whining the ground. Uh, water is kind of uh, where we head to in our older age. Uh -huh. So your dog is getting older. So his water is starting to come out. And one of the problems is those fire personalities, their heart will burn out. And so your dog's heart is starting to burn out. That's why he's got the murmur. Mm -hmm. And the water has been working really hard all his life to put out that fire. Mm -hmm. So the personalities all intertwine. And that's why the book tells us how to support those different personalities so that we don't burn out the fire completely or we don't kill the liver completely. Mm -hmm. um, we all want to support kidneys because kidneys start and end life. Mm -hmm. So they're very important. <laughs> wow. And now, um, so should I, should I focus more on the fire diet or the water diet you think, or which? I, both. So oh. usually what we do is we pick two to three diets for uh -huh. the dog and we rotate them. Gotcha. So definitely the heart chi tonic that I said on page 115, and then, uh, you know, try to figure out whether he's a little too hot or a little too cold. I think he's leaning more toward a little too cold. So, uh, the kidney young diet, uh, would be the right one from the Kidney. So let me give you a page number on that one too. So we do this kind of thing all the time. Um, and let me tell you, this book has made my life so much easier because I used to have to sit and write this out every time. Um, so you want page 151 or 153. Those are uh, good for your guy. Awesome. Amazing, 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 amazing. And now, got every, and every, every those for your heart diet. Yeah, everyone, everyone who's reading, you guys got to have to get the books so or, or figure out which uh, which uh, personality type your dog is, so you can get all these amazing re recipes. They're so great. Um, uh, do you have a, sp a, a way to? I, I mean, you're a vet, so you obviously know how to do this to check their respiratory uh, rate. How? What would you recommend for people who don't know how to do it? Uh, so. For heart dogs, that's really important because, we, and there is an app you can actually get on your phone so mm -hmm. that you can keep track of all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but you want to do it when they are sleeping or resting. So uh -huh. the easiest time to do it is when they're, you know, kind of flat out on their side and you just, you know, click your uh, timer on your phone mm -hmm. um, or set a little stopwatch or something for 30 seconds and just count how many times does the chest go up and down. That's one. Uh -huh. Up and down. So it'd be the same as us. You know, you take a breath in and your chest fills and then you let it out. That's one breath. Okay. Mm -hmm. We want it to be less than 30. You don't want to do this after he's out running around and he's panting. I mean, you know, try to count the panting. And Okay. His respiratory rate's 300. <laughs> Not when we want to do it. You want to do it when they're sleeping, when they're really quiet. So mm -hmm. a lot of times we do it in the middle of the night and I listen to our guys all snore, but I listen <laughs> to them at night. And so Pookie is the one that I worry about the most. And if I hear that rapid respiration, uh, you know, then I'm up looking for more uh, diuretics for her in the middle of the night. So, you know, if I'm getting that, you know, that kind of, <laughs> that's not good. If, especially if you have a dog with a heart problem, that's not good. Uh -huh. That's when you got to get more drugs on board. Gotcha. So you'll so give, so, cause you I have, know what normal is yeah. for your dog. Yeah. Cause I have emergency diuretics. My cardiologist gave me, but that he said, yep. cause I fly with him a lot. So he right, said, you exactly. know, if, if you're flying with him and he's like that, then give him a diuretic. But now I know yep. now if he's, cause sometimes when he's, but when he's sleeping, sometimes he just like does weird twitches or noises in his sleep. I don't know. I don't, it doesn't. Those are dreams. That's normal. Dreams. Okay. It's normal. Like when we travel with Pookie, that's when I see it the most that she gets the most stressed. And so she'll be laying on my head and it's just that <sighs> like, oh, we're in trouble. Now, um, I, I have to ask you, do you travel with all your animals or how do you, how do you do it? Like, <laughs> uh, depends where we're going. Uh, we don't fly with them because of their, um, neurologic problems. But, uh, in the motorhome, we will take, uh, 
generally four or five dogs with us. Uh-huh. Uh, Scout, our old cocker, hates the motorhome, just does not want to have anything <laughs> to do with it. So he stays home. Um, but yeah, if we're in the motorhome, we take everybody. If we're going to an expo or something and we're staying in a hotel and we can manage them, mm-hmm. uh, we'll take two or three. Um, we have a wonderful pet sitter who comes to the house and spends the night with them. That's good. <laughs> that's great. That's, that's what you, that's what you need. Um, now what do you mean by neurological problems when they're flying? Is it bad to fly with dogs? Cause that's something else, uh, somebody in the group was asking, is it dangerous no. or? Well, I don't like putting dogs in cargo just because uh-huh. of all the you know nightmares that we hear about. And so for those of you with big dogs, I really apologize because you don't have a whole big choice. Um, and certainly don't put your dog up in the cabin over yeah. the seats. That was a nightmare. Um, but our dogs have something called SM, which is syringomyelia. And uh, it's very common in Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. And it's a fluid pocket within the spinal cord. And that pocket will kind of expand and contract with differences in pressure. So think of how many times your ears pop when you're going up and down in the airplane. Well, these guys are getting that in their spinal cord and it can be very painful. Wow. It's not that they can't fly, but I'm a little nervous about them flying. Uh And, you know, when they get painful, particularly our 18 year old, he screams at the top of his lungs. And I do not want to subject anyone on an airplane to hearing my dog screaming. Uh, I don't want to subject me to hearing my dog screaming. Uh, My husband would probably lose it and cry. And that would be the end of that. And so, (laughs) so we just, uh, and, and we have a lot of them. Yeah. And it's kind of funny. At one point we thought about uh, buying a vet clinic that was for sale in Belize. And one of the things that stopped me was, oh my gosh, we have all these dogs and flying back and forth with them all the time would kind of be a bit of a nightmare. And I talked to one of the clients at the clinic when we were there and she had moved to Belize with five pugs. Now, Belize is hot and humid. It is the worst environment in the world for a short-nosed breed. I mean, I, pugs in Belize, just kind of a nightmare. But I said to her, how did you get all these dogs here? And she said, we pro- chartered a private jet. It wow. was cheaper and easier to charter a private jet for their family. They were from Ohio. They uh, drove down to Miami and hired a private plane from Miami to Belize to get their dogs there. Wow, that is so obviously not going back and forth a whole lot of times. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. That is that is a lot. So, do you think uh, flying, if if a dog has heart problems or a murmur, you think it's okay, or you think it's is it still a little dangerous, or? I think it's okay. I mean, look at all these dogs. We're flying back and forth to Japan and France. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And they're doing okay. That's, that's... So that part doesn't worry me as much, but I, I, I think you're very smart to travel with your emergency meds for sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. And now um, the the last question is sometimes when I do feed him the, um, the, the home cooked food, and not your, not your, not your brand, of course. But when I was just, you know, trying to trying to figure it out, he does get diarrhea. What is a good right. grain? Because sometimes if I put rice in there, it doesn't really help. Yeah. So you need to figure out what works for your dog. Uh-huh. Um, oats sometimes work much better. Uh-huh. And there are some dogs that need some carbohydrates in there. And in the Yin and Yang book, under at the bottom of each recipe, it says if you want to add grains to the diet, uh-huh. if your dog needs them or if you want them. For, you know, so particularly if you're feeding big dogs and you need a little more bulk to the diet because it's, you know, a lot to make, um, it'll tell you which one should be added for which diet. Uh, so it uh-huh. is, we actually tune the grains into the, to the dog as well. Amazing. Uh, so, you know, if you need to use them to bind things, you know, like I said, our old man, Charlie, we're using a little bit of brown rice. Sometimes we're using white potatoes and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a fan of white potatoes at all, mm-hmm. but it's what's working for him. And then we also use, let's see if I have it. Oh wait, I actually have a bottle sitting here. We use this product called RX clay. Uh-huh. Um, it's just, it's a, it's like a chalky powder and it's really good at getting the stool back to normal. Uh, the other one that we use is Dr. Harvey's Runs Be Done. That works really, really well. It's just a powder you add to the food. Uh-huh. Now, your your final, final question, your your practice. <laughs> I'm sorry for asking you everything, but I'm just so I'm so excited to, to talk to you and talk to someone who knows so much about dogs. Now, you do acupuncture. Do you think that has, has helped your dogs who have um, cardi- cardiac problems? Or- oh, acupuncture helps so many things. So we do acupuncture. We do cold laser. We do chiropractic care. Uh, the acupuncture can be really helpful for cardiac dogs. Acupuncture is helpful for endocrine problems, infections. I mean, it, it can do a lot of things. 
the cold laser is really good for pain, uh, for healing wounds, you know, non-healing wounds or mm-hmm. infected wounds, really good for that. Um, so for my guys, you know, if, if I was not such a busy mom, they would be getting acupuncture and cold laser every day. George had an episode over new, uh, new year's extreme pain, his little neurologic problem. Just, we came home one night and he, he was just screeching and wouldn't stop. And so I brought home acupuncture needles and the laser and he got it twice a day, every day laying on his bed under a lot of drugs. Yeah. Um, and on day four, he popped up and said, okay, ready to roll. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's very, very, very effective. Um, so if you have, you know, out in LA where you guys are, you uh-huh. get tens of tens of alternative vets that do acupuncture and laser and all kinds of cool stuff. So if you've got a holistic vet, best place to find, uh, if you're not in LA, <laughs> uh, ahbma.org, which is the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association. You, they have a vet finder by state. So you can go in there and look and see if there's somebody in your area. That's amazing. And which out of all those methods, is there one specifically that has helped your dogs more or? Um, for, for, for the, for the heart problems. Cause that's my main. For the heart uh, problems, I would go with acupuncture. Okay. Well, diet is very, very important and supplements, but, uh, but if I was going to do any of those other holistic things, the acupuncture, absolutely. Uh-huh. And really any good. other last tips or advice, uh, for people out there that, that are dealing with senior pets or, or pets that, that need that extra care? Two things. Stop over vaccinating your pets. Do not get vaccines every year. Basically, you need to stemper and parvo as puppies. It lasts a lifetime for the most part. Uh, and you need rabies as the law says you have to do it. Uh, and the second thing is stop using all the flea and tick chemicals. They're toxic. They're killing dogs, killing cats. Use natural products instead. Mm-hmm. So it- essential oil products. Uh-huh. Any specific- and I have a great blog. I have a great blog on natural flea and tick prevention. Amazing. So if you just Google <laughs> Dr. Judy Morgan, natural flea and tick, it'll pop right up. And in that blog, uh, you know, where you can put in links, there's like links to all the products I like and where to get them and all that kind of stuff. Awesome. Awesome. And now what's your YouTube channel? Because you do, you do those amazing live streams. I feel like I, everyone should go subscribe to your yeah, YouTube. So my live streams go live. We're, we're live most mornings, 8 a.m. Eastern during the week and 9 a.m. on the weekends, unless something crazy happens, like, you know, dogs having strokes. Um, and they are on my Facebook page, which is Judy Morgan DVM. We try to live stream them on YouTube at the same time. And I think that is under Dr. Judy Morgan. Um, I had an old YouTube channel, but I think it's under Dr. Judy Morgan on my Facebook page. If you go on the left-hand side where it lists videos, there's over 700 videos on there. Most of them are labeled. Um, And the same with the YouTube page. There's probably 400 on there now. Well, I love all of your books, guys. I think that you should get all of them because I found there's just so much information and different recipes in in every single one. (laughs) Definitely, definitely, definitely. So you should definitely check them all out. This one definitely has all the amazing stuff about the Chinese medicine that I still have to, I have to, to understand more. I will read it's more. It's a lot to digest. Yeah. But it all applies to people as well. Uh, so you can diagnose yourself and go, oh, okay, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. The tongue, <laughs> the tongue thing is amazing. I, as soon as we get off here, I'm going to go look at my tongue in the, in, in the mirror, but thank you so much for being on my, my show. <laughs> thank you i really appreciate it for sure yeah and guys if you um look in my description or up in my description i'll have all of her socials make sure to follow her everywhere and yeah these these products are amazing i'm gonna share them with all of my friends thank you <laughs> thanks i hope you have a great day and i hope uh the the schnauzer the the big schnauzer is is <laughs> is better <laughs> Yeah, she seems to be. She, I think she's getting dinner served right now, so oh, yeah. I think she's doing okay. That's great. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Judy. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.